Yeah. Nice. First burbot. New species. Oh, they are cold. <laughs> My name is Zachary McNaughton, and I am not a professional angler. I've been fishing for over 20 years, and the one thing that these years have taught me most is that I have a lot to learn. So let's meet some of Vermont's true master anglers, and together we'll discover some fishing techniques and explore the many species that this great state has to offer. Uh, yeah, burbot are in the cod family. Um, I believe they're the only completely freshwater member of the cod family and obviously the only member of the cod family in Vermont. And that's probably why they taste so good. And yeah, we're, we're fishing at night, we get set up usually while there's still some light, but the activity happens after dark. Usually the first hour to hour and a half can be pretty fast action and then it'll slow down a little bit after that, but it, it keeps going. We do consider them to be kind of a, I guess, an underutilized or underpursued fish in Vermont uh, because we have so many other great species to target. The other reason why people might not target them very much is just because it is kind of different to fish for them. They are almost exclusively nocturnal and they tend to be in deep water and the best fishing for them is actually probably in the winter. One reason why they're easier to catch in the winter is because they're, they're more active in the winter because they actually spawn in the middle of the winter under the ice. We don't know for certain exactly when the spawning dates are in Vermont, but we believe it's in early February. I typically have fished for them in late February, early March, so that it, it's post-spawn. Well, pretty much every fish I've caught has been done spawning. And uh, I think they're, you know, starting to eat again to, to rebuild their energy reserves after using all that energy to spawn. So these prefer live bait over like cut bait or? Um, probably the best thing would be smelt, live or dead. But uh, smelt are hard to come by. Yeah, so we're fishing shiners on the bottom of the lake. And uh, some of them I've killed on purpose. Some of them are still alive. The main thing is you want them to be on the bottom. So we're using a depth sounder first to get, to figure out the depth. And we move, a, I've got a, a using a, a button or, or a bead for a, a marker for the line where I want the depth to be. But I want that bait to be right on the bottom. And so the bait is on usually about a size six bait holder hook. I've got some different hooks out there, but that's kind of what I typically use. I've got about a 20 pound test monofilament leader. Uh, you don't have to worry about it, heavy line because it's dark and the fish aren't gonna see it. And then I've got that tied to a barrel swivel and above that barrel swivel, about a, either an eighth or a quarter ounce weight just to help get it down. And then the main line on the tip-up is just typical uh, uh, braided tip-up line. And um, so we've got, got those set down on the bottom. Just bend over the flag and put it on here. And when a fish holds it. If we see a flag, we are usually you know giving it at least about 30 seconds these fish usually take it right away and swallow it right away you usually don't have to wait too much but just give it a little bit of time to make sure that they um, get it in their mouth and like i said usually they're swallowing it um, so you might walk up to it you might see the spool turning that's a good sign you might not that doesn't mean that it's not there these fish typically don't run very far in fact, sometimes they don't run at all and you need to go around and pick up your tip-ups every once in a while just to feel who, if there's any weight because they may not have tripped the flag. Um, but then we slowly pick up the line and feel for resistance and when you feel the weight, then you give it a tug to set the hook, a good solid tug. And then just start bringing the line in hand over hand and try to lay it out, kind of spread it out on the, on the snow and ice 
so it's not all end up being in, ending up in one big clump that's going to be a mess when you try to deal with it. Um, and then, yeah, just play them like you would anything else. Of course, you don't have a drag, so your hands need to be the drag. If it's a really big fish and it wants to run, just kind of let the line slip through your hands a little bit um, to, to give it some, some line. These fish don't fight especially hard. So it's usually, especially when you've got, if you've got a 20 pound leader, you usually don't have to play them very much. And they usually have swallowed the hook, so you, you don't have to worry about the hook popping out usually. I think burbot probably would like boulder habitat. We typically don't fish there because we don't want to get hung up, but uh, they do eat a lot of crayfish. So I think fishing in a boulder area would probably be good. In fact, I've done it once or twice and, and we did do okay. But usually I'm fishing on a, a sandy or silty bottom near some kind of a drop. I fished from the top of a drop down, so from 10 feet down to maybe 50 feet on that drop and caught fish all along that. The smaller fish tend to be in the shallower water. Um, and tonight we're fishing kind of at the bottom of the drop, so most of our lines are set in, a, in roughly 50 feet of water and we have some coming up the edge. So the, the flat is about is mostly about 50 feet and then it the edge goes up to the shoreline. So we're we our shallowest sets are in about 35 feet of water um, and right on the edge of that that drop and then most of them are out in roughly 50 feet on that flat. We also often end up fishing near where there are smelt. Although there there can be smelt all over a water body but um, places where there are smelt is probably a good place to look because the burbot are going to be looking around trying to pick off uh, any dead dead or weakened smelt or maybe even take a live one. Places to fish for burbot, um, they're in Lake Champlain. There's not a lot of people targeting them there because it's not really well known where exactly to go for them by most people. Uh, there's a... Uh, so. Other than Lake Champlain, the better fishing for burbot is all up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, Willoughby Lake is is definitely the uh, the most popular, but Seymour Lake has a lot of them, and they're uh, pretty decent size, similar size to Willoughby. Uh, Maidstone Lake has them. I think my sense is that there's fewer of them, but they tend to be a little bit bigger on Maidstone, just a little bit. Echo Lake has a lot of them, but they're small. Uh, Lake Elago uh, reportedly has some. I've never caught them there myself, but I've, I've heard enough stories that I believe that they're there. I believe they're in the Connecticut River, although I don't know of anybody that's really fishing for them. And I'm not sure how big they are in the river, but I'm, they are in the Connecticut River. I'm just not sure if they're big enough that people would be interested in fishing for them. Um, so those are the the, the lake populations where you know they're big enough that people would actually want to target them. We have them in lots of rivers and streams all over the state, and, but they tend to max out at about 12 or 13 inches in the streams, and they just mature early and at a small size, and and they survive and they they reproduce in those streams. And nobody's really fishing for them again because they're nocturnal and they're small, and so people aren't really targeting them in those streams. So you pull till you feel weight? Yep. You know, if you look online for burbot fishing, you know, YouTube videos or pictures, you'll often see really big fish. In fact, I think the world record is about 50 pounds. Um, and they're all over uh, the Northern Hemisphere. They're the same species as over in Siberia and in Europe. It's the same species that we have over here in, in North America but in other places they tend to get bigger.
standard size. Yeah, standard size. The populations in New England, the fish seem to be much smaller on average. Vermont state record, I think, is just a little over eight pounds. Um, but I think that the reason that we have that smaller size structure here is because we have those populations that are in the rivers and they're adapted to maturing and reproducing at a smaller size, maxing out at a smaller size, because that's what works in that those small river systems. And those fish, you know, they often aren't necessarily necessarily reproducing with those lake fish, but I think they they, you know, they share enough of the same genetics that our fish in our lakes tend to not get quite as big as they do in other parts of the world. I just think because of uh, just a different life history strategy here. Ooh, it's running. Hmm. Oh yeah. That's weird. It's hooked right off the bat. Yeah. Another water body where you can catch them is Lake Memphremagog. They're in there. Uh, but again, it's people catch them by accident. Sometimes nobody's really targeting them. Um, and you could get the occasional fish, uh, the occasional burbot in Salem Lake and Island Pond as well. Just caught up the buck. The Vermont Master Angler minimum size for burbot is 22 inches. Um, and we don't get a lot of entries most years. There might only be two or three some years. Uh, and that's probably typical. Right. That's a little bit better. Not a lot of people are fishing for them is the main thing. And then, you know, if you have few people fishing for them, not everybody knows about the Vermont Master Angler Program. So those few guys that are fishing for them might not even think to enter them. And, and a 22 inch burbot isn't, is not, it's not a guarantee. Uh, I, uh, I usually, I fish burbot uh, one to three times a season and I don't get a 22 incher every, every season. In fact, I think I've only caught three of them, two or three of them. That was surprising. <laughs> It wasn't so subtle of a You can catch them jigging and that can be a lot of fun. In my experience, rarely is jigging more effective than the tip-ups. Um, usually just because you can put so many more tip-ups out there and, and, um, and cover more water. Uh, but there are times when jigging can be more effective. Uh, and what we're jigging when we jig is something that glows in the dark like a, a, a glow-in-the-dark curly tail grub uh, often with a piece of live bait on it to add some scent. Uh, you could use a Berkeley Gulp on there as well. Um, but you want to keep that, that nice and charged so it's glowing brightly. The first night that I fished with jigs, I, I, I took Drew Price out um, fishing for burbot. It was his first time going out and he wanted to jig for them and I didn't think it would it would work that well. I brought my tip ups and I set out tip ups and jig and uh, Drew started jigging and he he caught I think one or two fish before I got anything on the tip ups and so then I, he let me borrow uh, borrow a jig and I started using it and started catching some fish as well and I did catch I think I caught more fish on the tip-ups uh, than I did with the jig, but not much more, um, which, you know, I had seven tip-ups out and was jigging with one line, so it was pretty effective. The thing that really sold me on it was at the end of the night, we were, I was picking up my tip-ups and I would uh, pick up a tip-up, I'd drop that jig down there, jig it a little bit and let it sit. And I had smelt on those tip ups, which is like one of the best baits you could use. And I would pull up that tip up and uh, 
right and i go get the next tip up while that jig rod was sitting there and when i came back at least twice i ended up with uh with a burbot on that jig in a hole where i had just had a smell uh, so that was when i realized you know this this jig can actually be more effective than live bait in some situations but most of the time that hasn't worked out like that usually the live bait it works better after three years of chasing these fish, I finally caught a master angler and I wanted to share that with you now. Alright, you guys are already getting flagged, so I'm, gonna, I'm setting up my last um, hole right here. So uh, I just want to show you a new product I'm using in my process. So uh, it's really cold tonight, so the holes are already frozen by the time I'm getting to them to set up. So here's what I'm using. This is a fishing wrap system bait wrap, and I have uh, at home with my meat grinder, I ground up a bunch of smelts, uh, crayfish, and shrimp, and it's all in there as uh, you know, just a mush bait. So what I'm gonna do is just inject this chum into the bag I'm putting on one minnow then I put on my bag here and twist it up and I'll just go back through the material once more and it's ready to go There she is, baby. What a way for That's my mess angler. Look at that. That is a beautiful fish. Sweet deal. Thanks for watching this episode of Vermont Master Anglers. For more content, visit our Facebook page at Vermont Master Anglers. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe.